Lee is half Hopi and half Navajo, and he's had his share of experiences both on and off the reservation. One summer in the mid-90s, when Lee was 14, he spent the summer at his grandma's house on the Navajo reservation, just kind of helping her around the house. He loved to spend time with his grandma, eat her fried bread, hers was the best, and hear her tell stories, stories that scared the crap out of him. True stories about ghosts and black magic and skinwalkers. And she told him stories about his father and his grandfather and their run-ins with skinwalkers. Now, every now and then, his grandma would hire Ernie, who was a local guy who would come out and kind of help her with things that she needed done around the property. And one late evening, his grandma asked Lee to take Ernie home. Ernie lived in a house about four miles away from where his grandma lived in the valley. And Lee was more than happy to comply because he was only 14 and this meant he got to drive the truck. Now keep in mind that on the res, nobody cares that you're 14 and driving around. Hell, there's nobody around to see you doing it anyway. And Lee had driven plenty of times before, so he had plenty of experience. But he was always happy to pick up more. So his nine-year-old brother jumps in the cab of the truck with him, and Ernie and Lee's dog jump in the tailgate of the truck, and they are off. And after Lee drops Ernie off in the shack that he and his brothers call a house, he and his brother turn around and head back down the road back to Grandma's. And the sky is a deep red as the sun is starting to set behind them. And the radio is playing music from the only station that they can pick up, broadcasting out of Holbrook, Arizona. And there's nothing weird, nothing unusual. Lee and his brother are just soaking in the perfect summer evening. And after driving for a bit, something kind of catches Lee's attention off the side of the road to the right. And Lee slows down, thinking that it's one of the many free-roaming sheep in the area that have a really bad habit of jumping out in front of vehicles. So he slows down until he passes where he thinks that he saw it, and then he starts to speed up again, thinking nothing else of it. Suddenly, he feels this dark feeling of fear and dread, and he doesn't know where it's coming from, but he just knows something is very wrong. And Lee looks in his rearview mirror and sees the silhouette of something that he thinks was the sheep that he just passed. But the sheep starts growing, unfurling, expanding, stretching until it becomes something else. Something that's very tall and skinny with long arms and long legs that seem to be covered in some kind of fur. And whatever it is, it starts running at the truck. And Lee knows it's not a normal human or any kind of human at all. And he hears his brother start crying in the truck next to him. And his dog is in the bed of the truck barking ferociously at whatever this thing is. And this thing is chasing them and gaining ground even though Lee's doing about 30 miles an hour at this point. So he speeds up. And he and his brother and the dog are all shaking violently as the truck is going over this washboard gravel road. And the sound of the rattling truck hitting the rutted road is almost deafening as he pushes the truck faster, upwards of 65 miles an hour. But this thing is only getting closer. And Lee is struggling to keep control of the truck as it is fishtailing from one side of the dirt road to the other. And his brother screams, it's coming up on your side. And Lee is as scared as hell as a million thoughts are going through his brain. Is this real? Is this thing gonna kill us? What is happening? And at the moment, he thinks is going to be their last. The truck careens around a bend in the road where they come upon a car coming in the opposite direction. And as the two cars pass one another, Lee feels instant relief wash over him. Whatever was following them is gone. He doesn't know if it decided to hide because of the other car or if it decided to go chase the other car. And he doesn't care. All he knows is that he can feel that it's gone and he can breathe again, shaken up, but still alive 
They make it back to Grandma's house, wondering what the hell just happened. And as soon as the truck stops, the boys jump out, slam the doors, run inside the house, not looking back, hoping that whatever it was that was chasing them didn't follow them home. They slam the front door shut, lock it, close the windows, and stand there, catching their breath. And Grandma sees that they're shaking and asks, what happened? So Lee tells Grandma they were just chased by something at 65 miles an hour. And Grandma's response, yeah, things like that happen around here. Lee and his brother look at each other in a shared revelation that all of those stories that they have been told by Grandma since they were babies are true. Stories about black magic and witches and skinwalkers. They're real. Needless to say, the experience changed Lee's life. He no longer wanted to be out after dark or sleep out in Grandma's backyard and watch the stars. As a matter of fact, he never drove at night on that reservation again until he was 21 years old. Lee says he believes skinwalkers are evil men and spirits that use black magic for evil doing. And as far-fetched as it may sound, they are real. And he believes that if God and his greatness are real, then the devil is real as well. And like God, has ways of showing himself. But what happened that evening really did happen. And it scared the crap out of him. And Lee invites anybody to visit his part of Arizona if you have any doubts. He promises you won't be disappointed. It was 1995, and Tony had just graduated from high school. And as he's hanging out with a friend of his, John, that he hasn't seen in seven years, Tony asked John, you ever been to New Orleans? John said, no. And Tony said, let's go. And they did. Between the two of them, they had $140. But back then, that was more than enough. They made it to New Orleans, almost died of culture shock, and turned around and headed to Magnolia, Mississippi to get some sleep. They stayed at the Magnolia Inn, which was pretty crappy, but it was clean and cool. And it was May or June in South Mississippi, so cool was the only adjective that mattered. And they stayed up that night playing poker, drinking Gordon's vodka, and talking about who knows what. Probably girls, or college, or college girls. And at some point, John said, ever been to Texas? And Tony said, no. And John said, well, pack up, let's roll. They had a road atlas and saw that Marshall, Texas was just across the border from Shreveport, Louisiana. Now, Tony says he doesn't know what it's like now, but back in 1995, Shreveport looked and smelled like the place that metal and oil went to die. It was dirty and gross. At one point, they crossed a bridge and saw people fishing just a 100 yards downstream from where a factory was draining waste into the river. And the locals reminded him of locals from his own hometown. Bald-headed women, cross-eyed men, and bald and cross-eyed children. And Tony said he apologizes for that description, but he said it really was like a Rob Zombie movie come to life. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that may have had leprosy. But Marshall, Texas was 40 miles away, so they rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Ant Festival. So they stopped at a local barbecue joint and had a Coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. And it was starting to get late. The sun was setting. So they pulled out their map and they decided to backtrack a little bit so that they could hit Route 43. That would take them through Karnak and eventually they'd be able to hit Route 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When they did leave the barbecue joint, it was getting dusk. And Route 43 is not well lit. John was driving and he was doing about 45 miles an hour because on that road, going any faster, even for a pair of teenage idiots, would have been really reckless. The road was dark and winding and full of hills that ended in curves. And there were lots of pairs of glowing eyes on either side of the road. And they could hear the crickets and the bullfrogs over the engine of that old Sentra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. And the humidity was a real thing, tangible. 
The air was thick and it smelled like pastures and hay and swamps. And they drove for what felt like hours. After midnight, Tony sees a sign that informs them that Bivens is the next town of any real size. And Tony feels himself being hypnotized by the yellow lines on the road. They hadn't seen another car in like an hour, and they are both getting pretty sleepy. So Tony rolls down the window and lights a cigarette, and he remembers that there is music on the tape player, either Tupac or Bob Seger. And he's just sitting there smoking his cigarette, absentmindedly flicking the ashes out the window. And as he took one last puff and flicked that camel short out into the woods, that is when he saw it. He hadn't really looked to the right in a while. Maybe he kind of did when he flicked his butt out the window. He doesn't really know. But what he does know is in his periphery, he could see something running with the car. It was just behind his window. And he looks over at the speedometer and it says 40 miles an hour. And he looked at his friend and his friend is looking straight ahead. So Tony just looks straight ahead, but he could still see it. He could see one huge R. Matted fur, rusty brown, sticky, almost primal. So he eased his right hand over and rolled up his window. And John is still looking straight ahead with his jaw clenched. And he put both hands on the wheel and sped up. No words were said. Tony still looked straight ahead. But out of his periphery, he could still see that arm moving, muscles and tendons visibly rippling underneath that matted hair. And as the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside them lost pace slightly. And that is when Tony saw the hand at the end of that nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched in a fist the size of a cantaloupe, a really big cantaloupe. It was covered in the same hair that was slightly darker around the fingers, like it was stained with something. And suddenly, the hand unclenched, and he saw the claws, black as midnight. Those claws were at least two inches long and sharp like an animal's. It wasn't a hand so much as it was the paw and claws of a beast whose sole purpose is to kill and eat. So Tony looked at John, looked at the speedometer, 50 miles an hour, and looked straight ahead again. The thing was still there. So Tony lit another cigarette, didn't open the window, and just said, Shit. The music had stopped a while ago, and Tony broke the silence by asking John, Hey, do you... And before he could finish, John said, I see it. I've been seeing it for a long time. And Tony asks, how much do you see it? And John says, more than I want to. And Tony says, speed up, John, just speed up. It cannot keep up with us forever. And Tony feels the car start to speed up, looks at the speedometer again, 55 miles an hour. And whatever it is that's chasing them finally starts to lag behind. So Tony musters the courage to just look a little bit to his right. And he says that in his 37 years of life, he only has two regrets. One of them is picking up that first cigarette. The other is looking to his right. The beast was huge. Its chest stood above the hood of the car and was covered in that reddish brown matted fur. And the thing started to bend forward as it ran. And Tony saw the face of this thing. And all reality stopped. They were no longer driving down some road in Texas. They were now trying to escape the depths of some monster inhabited hell. This thing's face is beyond any power that Tony has to describe it. It 
is evil. The eyes were black and the pupils were red. And this thing flashed its teeth at Tony in a saliva dripping snarl with teeth that were yellow and huge. It opened its eyes wide and it looked hungry and pissed. It opened its mouth and the skin pulled back and all you could see were black gums and yellow teeth. And Tony could feel the car start to go faster. Fucking hell, John, just go. And Tony prayed and he cussed and he lit another cigarette. And then, like sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road in front of them straightened out. And Tony just said, don't you slow down. They drove through Bivens and on to Texarkana and then home. And they never said a word. It was years later, 11 to be exact, before they even talked about it again. And even then, they didn't talk about it much. John said he hadn't told anyone. Tony said he hadn't either. But Tony says he finally did tell that story for the first time just a few years back when he was parked out on a gravel road doing things that you do out on a gravel road when you're parked there with a good-looking woman. And he told it again about a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted a scary story around the campfire. They didn't sleep for a day or two, but they asked him about a dozen more times to tell the story again. But he never told anyone until now that he saw its face. Tony says he's only been scared for his life twice in his life. Once was with a grizzly bear in front of him and a terminal velocity drop down a cliff to the side of him. The second was on that road. And he says, you can call it what you will. You can call it bullshit if you want, but look him in the eye, let him tell you the story and you'll know. Never doubt that there are things in this world that defy logic and explanation. The boogeyman is real. This story was submitted by Delta 412. We're going to call him Dean. Dean was around four years old when his parents bought this old 1970s RV. And they decided to take Dean and his older brother Pat out on a camping trip. And Dean doesn't remember a whole lot about the beginning of that trip until that night. He remembers sitting around a campfire that night trying to make hot dogs and s'mores with his family. But the marshmallows were always so hot and they seemed to burn his hands every time. And it starts getting dark and everyone's tired. So they all head into the RV for the night. And Dean is still small enough that his mom lets him share the bed with her. And she tries to get some sleep. But as the night goes on, she finds herself awake, tossing and turning and just feeling kind of off. So Dean's mom is awake when something starts to shake and bang and pound on the RV. And his mom, feeling pretty freaked, grabs Dean tight. At first, she thinks it's a bear or something, but whatever it is, hops up onto the rooftop and tries to get in the RV using the emergency exit on the ceiling. And his mom tries to wake his brother Pat and their dad, but they seem to be long passed out. Not even all of the banging and the shaking is waking them up. Pat actually does wake up for about a second, lifts his head up, says, what's going on? and then immediately falls back to sleep again. And mom is nearly in tears with fear. And she grabs her prayer book and starts praying. And Dean, well, he's sitting there calm in his mother's arms as whatever it is outside is wrecking the hell out of the camper. And he wants to look out the curtains to see what it is, but his mom stops him. But in the process, she catches a glimpse of something like a dinosaur on two legs. And as mom begins to pray more and more, it seems to anger the creature outside, which just goes crazy. And throughout the night, mom also notices that dad seems to occasionally stop breathing. 
So she is waking him every few minutes just for a second to make sure that he's still breathing. And she wonders what kind of creature has the strength to keep up this constant bombardment of the camper for hours. Mom reads from her prayer book all night and watches the sun start to rise as the blue sky begins to light up. But even in pale sunlight, the creature relentlessly persists in its attack. And Pat finally shakes awake, and he kind of groggily gets up wondering what the hell is going on. And about five minutes later, the attack subsides. And after the banging stops, Pat wants to go outside and get the tennis shoes that he left out there, even though he had just been woken up by some psychopath attacking their camper. Mom pleads with him to not go outside. But I guess you can't keep some teenagers from their van's shoes. So Pat ducks out the door and in a few seconds miraculously makes it back inside the camper with his shoes. And he tells them he sees weird footprints all around the camper and claw marks everywhere. And that's when mom knows this was no ghost. This was a physical manifestation of something evil. Dad woke up soon after like nothing had ever happened. He basically slept through the whole thing. Dad didn't even believe in an afterlife back then, even though he went to church every Sunday. And everyone pours out of the camper to take a look at the damage, even though mom tries to keep Dean inside for fear that this creature might come back. And it's full morning now, and the other campers are wondering what the hell is going on as well. They all see the damage that this creature has done, as well as footprints on the ground of a three-toed beast and claw marks inches deep into the thin camper skin. Mom wastes no time and urges Dad to get them out of there fast. So they pack up the RV and head out. And as they're heading out, the police are coming in. Why? Don't know. But Mom thinks it's because of the ruckus that that creature made all night long. What took them so long? Anyway, Dean's parents sold the camper soon after. And even after seeing the evidence of this creature, Dad and Pat, they just kind of blow it off and forget the whole thing. But Dean and his mom will never forget, as that was perhaps the scariest night of their entire lives. Mom thinks the campsite was maybe located on a Native American burial ground where the soil had gone sour. Or maybe they were just trespassing on a place that the spirits didn't want them to be. But whatever the case, something was definitely physically there, flesh and bone. And it was something from a completely different world. This story comes from Joe, who explains that this is actually not his story, but it's his father's story from when his father was a little boy of 11 or 12 years old. Now, his father, Ed, lived in a really small house. It was just his parents and him and his two brothers. One night, Ed's parents had gone to Jamie's feast with some other people, leaving the three boys home alone to tend the sheep. So that night, as the boys are getting ready for bed, the dogs start going crazy outside. But they just thought it was some coyotes or something, so they just told the dogs to be quiet. And as they're trying to drift off to sleep, the dogs still are howling outside, so the kids are just telling them to shut up. And they finally do fall asleep for a while. But when Ed woke up a few hours later, everything was quiet. All he could hear was the breathing and the snoring of his brothers. But Ed needed to use the outhouse, so he woke up one of his brothers to take him there. And his brother was teasing him about being scared to go out there by himself. And Ed was scared to go out there by himself. So both boys get up 
His brother grabs a flashlight and they go outside to the outhouse. And once again, the dogs start going crazy and they're bounding all over the place outside, running around in the sagebrush. And his brother says he's going to use the outhouse first. So his brother goes in and Ed is just standing outside waiting for him. So while he's waiting, Ed is trying to follow one of the dogs with the flashlight. And suddenly there's this super loud whine from one of the dogs. Everything went quiet, too quiet for that time of night. Not even the sheep were making noise. Then all of a sudden, all the dogs start going nuts over by their truck. And Ed looks over and he sees a man. And this man was unbelievably tall. So tall that he was leaning his arm on the top of the cab of the truck. And he was looking down at the dogs for a few seconds. And then he kicked one of them. And they all scattered in different directions. And then the man looked at Ed. And Ed saw its face. It had a pure white face. Like the full moon. Two burning red eyes. And a slight smile that was pure black. Ed couldn't move or make a sound. And the man started to walk toward him in these unbelievably long strides until it was towering right over him. And all Ed began to see was dark blood red. But he kept getting deeper and deeper into the man's eyes. And he could faintly hear his brother coming out of the outhouse. And the thing evidently heard that too, because it turned to look at Ed's brother. And that is when reality came crashing back to Ed. And Ed looked at his brother and noticed that his brother was too preoccupied with his buckle to see what was going on. And he also noticed that this thing had long hands hovering just inches from his head. Its skin was black ash, and it smelled like a dead, bloated animal in summertime. And Ed was unable to move or speak as he watched this thing move closer to his brother. And when his brother finally did notice this thing, he became paralyzed just like Ed was. And as this thing got closer and closer to Ed's brother, something inside of Ed finally snapped. And he just got unbelievably angry. He broke from his trance and lunged at the skinwalker with his arms in the air like a wild animal, baring his teeth at it. And a growl came out of him that he never knew he could make. And he just got angrier and angrier at this thing that was trying to hurt them. And the thing was still smiling at first, but the angrier that Ed got, the more that smile started to fade. And finally, with everything that Ed had in him, he started to make this primal roar that just welled up from deep inside of him. And he roared at this thing. And the thing fell backwards and ran off into the night. But before it disappeared, it took one last glance back at Ed. And Ed could see that its eyes were now glowing very dimly and it wasn't smiling any longer. About five years ago, Brett and some of his friends decided they were going to go camping for the weekend. And after hanging out for a bit, they decided at about 3 a.m. to start their adventure with a 50-mile drive to the site of these old Spanish ruins. So they all jump in the truck with all their camping gear. They drive the 50 miles. They get there, get out of the truck. They hop the gate to the old Spanish ruins and start exploring. One of his friends had brought a flute and took it out and started playing it. And after about 30 seconds, something started screaming. It was just jumping from the top of one ruin wall to the top of the other ruin wall, screaming this blood curdling scream the entire time. And after one of the friends lost his bladder function, they decided it was time to get out. 
They all jump back in the truck and headed to Bandelier National Monument, which is where they plan to camp for the rest of the weekend. So they get to Bandelier probably 6, 7 a.m., and they set up camp, and they're all sitting around talking about what in the hell happened at those old Spanish ruins when Brent decides he needs to go to the bathroom. So he walks probably 300 feet away from camp to do his business. And this is where Brent says things get a little fuzzy. He looks around and he sees two dust devils coming right at him. And then he turns around and looks again, and it's two of his friends. And they're motioning for him to come with them. And he says he has to. It was like he was in shackles. He had to follow them. He says he followed them for about 10 or 15 minutes until whatever trance that he was under, he snaps out of it and looks at them again, and they're not his friends. Well, they're kind of his friends. First of all, his friends are brunettes, and the two people that he thought were his friends have red hair, but they have the faces of his two friends, except their eyes. Their eyes look like cat eyes. So he stops walking, and both of his friends turn around and give him the most terrifying gaze he has ever seen in his life. Movie monsters have nothing on the horror that was in that gaze. So he turned around and ran back to camp as fast as he could. So after about five minutes of a full-on sprint, he finds camp and his friends are still sitting around talking. They didn't even really notice that he was gone. And he tells them what he had just seen with these look-alike skinwalkers. And he and his friends all decide, pack up camp, and get on back to Albuquerque. From about the age of seven, Caleb would spend about a month every summer staying with his uncle in Wheatfield, which is in northeast Arizona. And he loved staying there because he and his cousin Dominic got to ride horses and play with the dogs and go fishing and go camping by the lake. And even his aunt would come over sometimes and go camping with them. And one night in the summer of 2010, when Caleb and Dominic and their aunt are all camping, their aunt says, you know what, guys, I'm going to go into town and pick up a friend of mine and pick up some munchies for you guys. And after she leaves, the boys decide to do some fishing. They catch a trout start a fire, and cook the fish for dinner. And as the sun starts to set, the area gets pretty quiet, and the boys are just chilling by the fire. And they usually hear howling and partying at night, but this particular night, it was just two campers on the west side of the lake, and one near the boys who was already asleep. And Caleb gets the feeling that something is watching them from the bushes. So he takes his flashlight and he shines it in the trees, and he sees nothing. And the coyotes start howling on the south side of the lake. And over time, the boys can hear them getting closer and closer. And Caleb starts freaking out when they hear one howl right behind them. And both boys decide, we're out. And Dominic starts putting his tackle box away. But he decides to put a big stick on top of it that would keep anything but a person out of it. And they put everything away as best that they can and hurry inside the tent. And after a little while, they can hear little footsteps behind their tent. And after about another 15 minutes, they hear something else outside their tent, like something trying to get into Dominic's tackle box. And something else was trying to get into his aunt's tent. But luckily, Caleb had tied it up with 30-pound fishing line. And then something else was trying to put out their campfire. And Caleb knows there were no people around there or they would have heard their heavier footsteps. And both boys have the feeling that whatever it is, that there's six of them. Because one is trying to put out the fire. One's trying to get into their aunt's tent. One's messing with Dominic's tackle box. But they can still hear what sounds like three of them behind their tent. And they know it has to be skinwalkers. Because not only is the air Filled with the smell of dead animals, but the boys could just feel something evil in the air. Now, Caleb and Dominic are both 14 that summer, and I personally think that the phrase curiosity killed the cat was coined specifically for 14-year-old boys because they just cannot help 
but peek under the tent flaps to see what it is that's moving around their campsite. And what they see freaks them out, to put it mildly. They see beings with the feet of a goat and the antlers of a deer walking around their fire. And the fire is pretty big, so they had a pretty good look at these things. And Caleb's heart is pumping so hard that he can feel it sending blood to every nerve ending. And he can hear the endless thudding in his ears. And the skinwalkers keep saying their names. Caleb, Dominic. Over and over. And the boys actually had aluminum bats with them in the tents. But they were way too scared to use them. And Caleb just keeps thinking that this is his last day in this world. And he starts praying to God that his aunt will come back soon. And he knows God answered his prayer. Because in less than 10 minutes, his aunt came back. And she's a little overwhelmed when both the boys come running at her from the tent, asking her over and over, Did you see them? Did you see them? And she told the boys that she saw a few guys around the campfire with what looked like furs on them. But as soon as her headlights hit them, they ran away. So all three of them kind of look around the campsite and they can see that that stick that Dominic put on his tackle box is now laying off to the side. And their aunt does her best to calm the boys down and get them back to bed. But the growls they hear later that night is enough to get Dominic up and out of his tent and spreading ash in a circle around both of their tents for protection. And to this day, when Caleb and Dominic tell their story, they start shaking because they are still so scared of what happened that night. And Caleb's aunt doesn't speak of it because she believes that if she does, whatever that evil was will come back to haunt them. And Caleb knows that this story doesn't sound real to some people, but he swears it's true. He knows there are skinwalkers and they are real. And if you don't believe him, go to the mountains near Wheatfield, Arizona, on the northeast side of Arizona or the northwest part of New Mexico. And just stay out there and wait for them to come. Because he guarantees something will happen. This story is from Romer 12. We will call her Riley and we'll call her friend Marcy. Riley lives in Gallup, New Mexico, a city surrounded in Native American culture and history. They have many surrounding towns and reservations that have been there for a long time. And lots of people say some of them are haunted. And Riley's experience actually takes place in Gallup on the east side of the city near a small reservation. Marcy would visit her sister every weekend in her low rental apartment on the east side of the city. And during these weekends, Riley would spend the night with Marcy in her sister's apartment. And at night, when there's absolutely nothing to do and the kids and the parents were asleep, Riley and Marcy would go outside and just chill in the courtyard park that was in the middle of the apartment complex. And one night, they are so bored, they decide to walk to a 24-7 convenience store at 2 a.m. And they were used to being up late, so they were wide awake. And they start down the road that goes behind the apartment building where there are no lights and tons of brush and prairie dog holes on the ground. And as they're walking, Riley senses somebody staring at them or following them. And she turns around to look, but there's nothing there. And she looks forward again and Marcy grabs her arm and whispers in her ear, Oh my God, what was that? Riley looks into the darkness and sees nothing. There's a slight breeze that night and there's a lot of trees in front of them. So Riley just kind of passes it off as the wind blowing and moving all of the trees. And Riley tells Marcy, it's just the wind, chill out. And the girls keep walking. But as Riley looks again, she sees what looks like a black figure moving through the trees. And she stops 
And she tells Marcy, I think that's just a drunk crashing out back there for the night. And Riley is doing her best to keep a calm voice so she won't scare the crap out of Marcy. But that was almost impossible because she was sensing that this thing in the trees wasn't a drunk crashing out for the night and that it wasn't nice. And she asked Marcy, do you want to go back home? And Marcy says, no, we're almost to the store. Let's just keep going. As they keep walking, they hear movement in the trees, swift, fast movement as if something is darting around. And they start walking faster, like power walking. Riley hears something behind them, so she turns to look, and she sees what looks like a wounded dog or something. Now that in itself isn't super scary, because where they live, they have lots of stray dogs. But what she hears next stops her dead in her tracks and paralyzes her from the legs up. Riley hears this thing kind of moan and growl at the same time as if it wanted her for a snack, and she can't move. And Marcy tries snapping her out of it, saying, come on, come on, we gotta run. But Marcy's screams sound distant, as if Riley's gone deaf, or as if she's far away. Riley had made eye contact with this thing, and she knew that was a bad decision. And Riley closes her eyes, and says a short prayer and turns around and runs for her life with Marcy right at her side. And she tries not to look back, but something is commanding her to look behind them. So she turns around and she sees a man running straight at them. But he isn't just running, he's on his hands and knees. And Riley screams, And that scares Marcy, who joins in. And they start running faster until they finally get to the road where there's light and cars passing by. They'd run for about seven minutes nonstop and were completely out of breath with their sides aching and cramping. And as they stop to catch their breath, Riley looks behind them again and sees the man way off in the distant darkness going back the way he came from. And they walk not even two minutes and they get to the convenience store. And the lady behind the counter gives them a weird look and says, are you girls okay? And they both nod and in between breaths manage to spit out, yeah, just a late night run. And Riley could tell that the clerk didn't believe them. And she asked, did you girls run from the apartments? And Riley answered, yeah, why? And the clerk says, really? Are you girls sure you're okay? And Riley and Marcy look at each other. And Marcy tells the clerk, well, not really. Something was chasing us and we have no idea who or what it was. The clerk says, you girls just ran from a skinwalker. It chases anyone. It catches walking that road alone at night. You girls are lucky you made it this far. And as if the girls aren't shaken up enough already, what the clerk tells them rattles them even more. They don't have any money. So the clerk offers them a bottle of water, closes down the store, and gives them a ride back home. And as they drive by the bushes and trees that they had just run past, they all see something running in front of them. And the clerk says, just ignore it and close your eyes. And they finally get back to the apartment complex. And the clerk tells them, you girls stay home at night now. There's no reason for you both to be running around at two in the morning. Keep yourself safe. You hear? Riley and Marcy nod, waving goodbye and thank you. And they never left that apartment complex after midnight again. Jim comes from a small town in northern Arizona, which is sandwiched between the Paiute Reservation to the north and the Navajo's largest reservation to the south. And the high school that he went to was so small, 
It was a 1A division high school that graduated like 80 students a year. So consequently, the sports teams always had to travel like five to 10 hours to go compete with other high schools. And usually they would get on their bus, go to the game, play, and then stay in a hotel overnight and head back home the next morning. But on this particular trip, the coaches told them that the school couldn't afford to pay for the hotel for all of the players. So they were going to have to go play and come back all in one trip. So they're going to be on the road for like 12 hours total. So the team gets on the team bus, head to their game, play their game, and start to head back home. They were on the bus for about two hours when they crossed onto the reservation. And at this point, it was about 2 a.m. So pretty much everybody is sleeping except him. And Jim says he noticed that not long after they crossed the border onto that reservation, the bus driver, who usually went just the speed limit, had that bus going probably about 80 miles an hour. But Jim was thinking, well, well, that just means that we'll get home that much faster. And as he's looking out the window at the desolate desert landscape, which is kind of lit up by the moon, he sees this figure that's on a pursuit course with the bus and keeping pace with it at about 80 miles an hour. And as it gets a little closer, he could see it's kind of a humanoid figure. And as a matter of fact, it looked like a human, except it had half of its face painted black, half of its face painted white, and glowing red eyes. He said the eyes looked like rabbit's eyes that reflect the light of a spotlight. And he thought to himself, holy crap, it's a skinwalker. And he watched as this skinwalker came up and was keeping pace with the bus. And as Jim is staring at it, this thing is actually hurtling sage brushes and rocks at the bus. And then this thing makes eye contact with him. And Jim says all of a sudden, he could not look away. He said he felt as if something was holding his head in place so that he couldn't look anywhere else. And the skinwalker just smiled at him with a smile that went from ear to ear, showing these big yellow pointed teeth. And Jim says he was just panicking and he just felt like he wanted to throw up. And then as he's still watching, he sees the skinwalker crumple down and start running on all fours instead. He started to see the creature's bones crack and reform, and hair started sprouting out all over. And within the span of about three seconds, it was now a coyote, and it ran off into the distance. And Jim says, as soon as that thing was gone, he got up, went to the bathroom in the bus, and threw up. Now, he didn't really want to tell anybody about what happened because he thought everybody would think he was crazy. But he did tell a friend of his who also happened to be a Navajo. And she said, you need to see the chief and get a blessing. Now, it also happened to be that the chief was a friend of his. And the next morning, he met with the chief in the high school parking lot who recited a Navajo prayer over him. And Jim has not seen a skinwalker since then. Now, he says part of that could be due to the fact that he has since moved north. But he says if he ever does have to drive south, he goes around the reservation. Way around. Now, the person who wrote this story is going by the initials S.A. So for simplicity's sake, we're going to call her Sarah. Now, Sarah would go camping with her grandparents at the end of every school year. And she always looked forward to it because she grew up loving the outdoors. And she especially loved camping. The idea of making s'mores, of taking long hikes, of sitting around by the campfire, and even of the wildlife that they would find. Now, she grew up in California, mostly around the cities. So the forest was like a true home for her. She says she always preferred being around trees and dirt rather than buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were so much more quiet 
and peaceful. And she always felt safe when she was there, like nothing would ever hurt her. But something strange would always happen around the end of the month of May. She would have this recurring dream during the last week of the school year. She would be alone in the woods, walking down a dirt trail, and everything was strangely quiet. And she'd continue to walk down the path until she saw this fox poke its head out from around a tree. Its eyes were human-like, but they were yellow, and they kind of looked like a teddy bear's eyes. And it would just stare at her. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch her. Usually in her dream, she would go up to pet it, and that's when it made its first sound. It was a low, soft growl. But she would just continue walking, and the fox would follow her. Now, she first had that dream when she was about five years old, and she had it every year until she was about 11. And every year, it was the exact same thing. She'd be walking through the woods. She'd see the fox. She'd go to pet it. And then she would just continue her walk with the fox right next to her. And for a while, the dream was just a dream. Until about the fourth time that she had it. That's when the fox started to walk behind her. And that's when she started to get a bad feeling about the fox. She could hear it walking along behind her, making some odd noises. But when she turned to look at it, it was just walking along behind her like nothing was wrong. But somehow, it seemed like it was smiling at her. And Sarah says that she's sorry to go on about this dream, but feels that it's actually a warning about the creature that you need to understand before she can tell you about the first encounter. Now, the first encounter that she had, she was about six years old and she was going on a camping trip with her grandma and grandpa for about a week. And she remembers being at school for the last day of kindergarten and kind of wiggling in her seat because she's so excited because she knows grandma and grandpa are coming to pick her up when the school day is done. And when that bell rings for the last day of kindergarten, she picks up all of her stuff, goes running out of the door of the school and right in front of the school is her grandma and grandpa's pickup truck there, ready to pick her up to go camping. And Sarah says she remembers her grandpa's pickup truck. It was this old red pickup truck with a bench seat so that the three of them all had to sit in a row. So she was always in the middle between her grandma and grandpa for the whole two hour ride to where they went camping. Their special spot was pretty deep in the woods, far away from other people because grandma didn't like to be around other people while she was camping. So as they all piled out of the truck, Grandma and Grandpa set to work right away setting up the campsite. And Sarah wandered off a little bit. She wanted to go see if she could dig up some bugs out of the dirt. And she picked a spot, she sat down, and she started digging. And she noticed how unusually quiet the woods were. And the woods are never quiet, not even in the deep of night. There's always something making noise. And she thought it was kind of odd that it was so quiet. But being only six, she just didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. So as she's sitting there digging for bugs, she thinks she hears her grandma calling for her. Her grandma always called her by the nickname that she got when she was born, Sugar Booger. And that is what she thought she heard coming from the woods. But it was very, very far away and it sounded kind of sick. So she looked up and into the woods where she thought she heard it coming from. But she thought that can't be because grandma's over by the truck unloading stuff. But even age six, she knew that something about that wasn't right. So she kind of moved herself closer to where grandma and grandpa were setting up camp. But soon enough, she kind of forgot about this little weird encounter as they started to have fun. And for the rest of the day, they played card games. They sat next to the fire as they ate their dinner and they looked at the stars. Sarah loved looking at the stars because where she lived in the city, she could never see any until it rolled around to be about 9 p.m. And they all started getting kind of tired and getting ready for bed. Now, the camper had bunk beds, and she and her grandma would store their stuff on the top bunk, and then they would sleep together on the bottom bunk. And because grandpa snored, grandpa slept over on the couch. 
And Sarah always slept next to the window just in case she woke up at night and she wanted to look outside. But considering it had been the last day of kindergarten and everything, it was a big day. She was pretty exhausted and she fell asleep pretty quickly. The next thing Sarah remembers is waking up a few hours later. It was still pitch black outside, so it wasn't too long. And it wasn't a big surprise because she's never been a really great sleeper anyway. So she just rolled over to try to go back to sleep when she heard, As soon as she heard that, her eyes shot open. She knew it wasn't either of her grandparents. They were in the trailer with her. They were sleeping and neither one of them have ever been known to talk in their sleep. And she started to feel this terrible feeling in her gut, like whatever it was really wanted to hurt her. And even at the age of six, she knew this was not normal. Then she started to hear tapping on the camper just outside her window. It was soft, but it was just loud enough for her to hear it. And she just sat there, frozen in fear. She tried to brush it off that it was just a branch or something outside tapping on the window, but she knew that it wasn't. It really was someone or something tapping on that trailer. So she decided to try to be brave and take a peek out the window and look and see if she could see what was out there. Big mistake. She pulled the curtain aside just enough so she could peek, and all she could see were these large yellow eyes that were kind of glassy, but yet not really real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but very cold and very unwelcoming. And in that moment, she panicked and quickly closed the curtain up and then hid under the blanket because that was the only thing she knew to do when she saw a monster. She'd never been so terrified in her life and she could feel the tears streaming down her face. So she just curled up and clung next to her grandma for the rest of the night. But she could still hear that tapping noise getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. And she doesn't remember falling asleep, but somehow she did. And Sarah remembers her grandma waking her up around noon, saying that if she got up quick enough, they could go fishing. And she honestly didn't want to leave the trailer at all. She was terrified of running into whatever was out there. And she did eventually go outside, but she just kept looking around, terrified that whatever it was that she saw the night before was going to come and get her. And her grandma could tell there was something wrong. So her grandma just gave her a big hug and asked her what was wrong. So Sarah told her what she saw and what she heard. And surprisingly, her grandma believed her. And the next thing she knew, grandma was telling grandpa that they were changing camping sites. And it took a little bit to convince grandpa, but eventually he started hooking up the trailer to the truck. And grandma put Sarah in the truck, thinking that hopefully maybe if she's in there, she can kind of get some sleep. But she just couldn't sleep. She just felt like she was being watched and that every little noise was that thing that she saw. And if she closed her eyes even for a second, it was going to come to get her. And then she heard, Sarah, Sarah. And this time, Grandma was not too far away. And in that moment, she had never seen her grandma move so fast. Grandma looked into the bushes where they heard it and then looked at Sarah and she got in the truck and she gave Sarah a great big hug. And Sarah started to cry all over again, saying that she just, she just wanted to go home. And that's when grandpa climbed into the truck and Sarah was sobbing so hard to the point where she was coughing. Grandpa agreed they could just go home. And as they're driving away from the campsite, Sarah's just heartbroken that their whole camping trip has been ruined by something that she didn't even know what it is. And just then, something told her to look out the back window. And as she did, an ice cold fear just washed over her body. She saw a red fox with yellow eyes sitting in the middle of their campsite. The same red fox from her dreams sitting there with an eerie smile on its lips. Now, after that encounter, Sarah and her grandparents would go camping again. But from then on, they always camped in more populated areas. Now, Sarah says she wishes this were the end of the story, but it's not. She had one more encounter with this creature, and it was more terrifying than the first.
The second encounter happened when she was 17, so many years later. By this time, she knew what a skinwalker was, and she was still very paranoid anytime she went close to a wooded area. She still worried about seeing that fox, but time had passed and she didn't think about it too much anymore. That year, Sarah and her two younger siblings were spending their Christmas vacation with their aunt and uncle who lived way up in the mountains. And she liked the house they were staying at, even though it was still in the woods. The one thing she didn't like is that her aunt and uncle never closed the curtains, making it really easy for anything outside to see inside. But she felt safe in the house. She knew that her aunt and uncle would never let anything happen to the kids. And their aunt and uncle had a new puppy named Pam. Pam was only a year old and she was super excitable and usually would only listen to her uncle. But she was a good puppy. One of the days that they were there, her aunt and her little sister went into town to have a girl's day. And Sarah had thought about going with the girls, but she decided she would rather go with her uncle and her little brother on a four-hour hike that would take them to town. Now, it was a really chilly morning, but since they were doing so much walking, it felt really good. And they even decided to bring Pam so she could have some exercise. And after walking for about an hour or so, Sarah actually kind of started to slow down a little bit because she wanted to take in all of the beautiful woods that were surrounding her. She remembers thinking that it was so peaceful that she could just stay there. But after a little while, she started to feel something kind of odd. She noticed that everything had gone completely quiet. All she could hear were their footsteps and her little brother talking to her uncle. And Pam noticed it too. Her ears went straight up and she let out a soft growl. So Sarah started to pick up her pace a little bit to get closer to her uncle and her little brother, thinking maybe that a coyote or a mountain lion was nearby. But she knew that coyotes and mountain lions usually weren't out around that time. And even if they were, they certainly wouldn't approach she and her family on the road. Now, her uncle noticed it too. So he told Sarah and her little brother to stay close to him. And Pam, who was right next to all of them, was still growling. And Sarah started to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold feeling that she remembers from when she was six. And she tried so hard not to think of that creature, but that was all she could think about. She just felt like she was that same little six-year-old girl. Just then, she noticed her shoelace had come untied. So she knelt down super quick to try to tie it as fast as she can so she could hurry up and get out of there. That's when she heard it. And in that moment, her heart dropped to her stomach. Her eyes widened and she could feel herself starting to shake with fear. It was right next to her and she heard it as clear as day. She slowly turned her head and there it was. That same red fox with those same horrible yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time she could see it much more clearly. Its fur was all matted and disgusting, and its smell was so horrible, like like rotting flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were way too long for a normal fox, and its back legs kind of bent the wrong way. But the eyes were still the worst part about it, and they even looked emptier than she remembered. And she wanted to scream or run or cry, but she couldn't. She was just frozen, too scared to even blink. Then she heard it speak again. This time, however, it mimicked her little brother's voice. But before anything else could happen, Pam jumped in front of her and was growling and barking and snapping so aggressively that it snapped Sarah out of the frozen trance that she was in. And she ran to catch up with her uncle and her little brother. And when she looked back, the fox was gone. Now her uncle and her little brother didn't see what she saw because they were further ahead. But she heard her uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath as he gathered both her and her little brother close to him. And Sarah was just too scared to even look back again. She just kept her eyes on the ground and just refused to stop walking. And Pam had stopped barking, but he was still growling and refused to leave her side. And together, they just kept walking until they made it 
to town. And when they got there, her uncle called her aunt and asked that she come and pick them all up, saying something about it not being safe for them to walk back by themselves. And thankfully, her aunt came to get them all and was kind of confused because they'd been talking about this hike for days. And on the car ride back, Pam never left Sarah's side, was right beside her the whole time. Sarah says she knows that Pam knew that whatever that thing was, it was after her and was going to protect her. And she was very thankful that they had Pam there because who knows what would have happened if they didn't. When they got back to the house, Sarah told her aunt and uncle what she saw. And at that point, her aunt and uncle started to pray, make sure that all the locks were shut tight. And her aunt even put some stuff around the doors. Sarah said she thinks it was ashes, but she never did find out for sure. And unfortunately... This made them cut short their Christmas break as their aunt and uncle weren't sure that she was safe in the woods, so they took them back home the next day. Sarah felt terrible that their Christmas vacation was cut short, but she didn't actually really feel safe again until they had left those woods. Now, Sarah has long since moved away from California and now lives in Kentucky. And while she's happy to report that she has never seen the red fox again, she still wonders if maybe... It's still hunting her, and that someday she might run into it again. The writer of this story chose to remain anonymous, so we'll call her Anne. Anne and her bestie Karen go to college together, and Anne kind of wanted to learn more about Karen's Navajo background and traditions. So Anne decides to join Karen for a three-day stay at Karen's grandma's house on the reservation. Her grandmother lives near Tuba City, Arizona, out in the middle of nowhere, but surrounded by other rural homes. Now, the first day the girls are there, it's pretty chill. Nothing out of the ordinary. Until grandma mentions that she saw a stray dog come out of nowhere and it doesn't want to leave. And Anne's thinking, it is acting kind of strange and it's kind of ugly looking. It's got a black shaggy coat and it looks kind of like a mix between a German shepherd and a lab. The next day, grandma's in the kitchen making lunch and the girls are watching a movie in the living room which has a large picture window with the curtains wide open that looks out onto the front yard where the cars are parked. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf where the DVDs are kept. And Karen gets up to put the DVD that they had just watched back on the shelf, glances out the window, and freaks out. The dog is staring at them through the window, standing on the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do. And the other dogs in the yard seem to keep their distance. And Karen storms to the front door, opens it up and yells, get off the box. And the dog runs behind the shed. The girls head to Tuba City to get some groceries and come right back. And the dog is nowhere to be seen. Nothing unusual. And Grandma decides to go visit some friends. So now it's just the girls at home by themselves. And about five o'clock, they hear somebody trying to open the front door. They're both a little surprised because neither of them heard any cars drive out. And the dogs in the yard aren't barking. So they both go to the living room window so they can see who's at the door. And to their surprise and shock, they see that same black dog trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws wrapped around the brass doorknob, standing on its hind legs. Anne certainly thought that was weird, but inexplicably isn't freaked out. Karen, however, is. She opens the door and chases the dog off. Grandma comes back later, and Karen tells her what happened. Grandma does not like what she hears. But it's pretty late now, so all the ladies get ready for bed. Anne and Karen are sleeping in the spare bedroom because it has two beds. And one window that's open just a little bit so they can get the night breeze. They turn off the light, say their goodnights, and the night quiet settles in. Until 
They hear a noise coming from on top of the roof. Pitter-patter footsteps and panting and scratching. Then whatever is up there sounds like it jumps off the roof onto this plastic water barrel that's outside. And they can hear which sounds like barking. But as it grows louder, the other dogs start barking as well. And something starts running around the house barking. And it was no dog. Nope, it wasn't. This barking sounds human. A deep male voice barking like it knew that they knew that it wasn't really a dog. Then panting again by the window. And now the girls are freaking out. Karen goes to the window and opens the curtains to look out. And there is the stray dog on its hind legs looking into their bedroom. But this time it stinks and it looks like it's got two black holes in its neck with eyes that are twinkling like ugly, glossy spider eyes and paws that look like deformed hands with overgrown, thick, sharp nails. Both girls start screaming and slam the curtains closed. Grandma comes running through the door and she sees it too. She runs to her bed and grabs the shotgun that's underneath. Then she runs to the fireplace and grabs a handful of ashes. She grabs three shells, coats the shells in the ashes, and loads them into the shotgun. And she blesses herself in Navajo as she opens the door and heads outside to shoot it. And yelling in Navajo, she tells this thing, it's not welcome here. Get the hell out of here. Go prowl someplace else. And being a traditional family, the next day, Grandma calls a medicine man to come over. And he prays over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather, blesses the house, makes them all eat some bitter herbs, and gives Anne an arrowhead. Apparently, she needs to carry the arrowhead and a small pouch of corn pollen for protection. And Anne says, so far, seems to be working pretty well. The medicine man said the dog was a skinwalker. The body of the stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, created an illusion so they wouldn't know it wasn't a real dog. He also said that skinwalkers tend to hurt people using some kind of human bone straw to shoot at someone, think spitballs, but deadlier, to get human bones into their target. Doctors can't detect it, but that day, the medicine man pulled a piece of human skull out of Grandma's right shoulder. It was like two inches long and a half an inch thick, and it was real. Anne and Karen watched him pull it out of her. That was intense. Glenn's dad, JJ, owns a small delivery service out of Farmington, New Mexico. And in fact, it's so small that he is the only employee. But he has a few trucks and a trailer, and he mostly takes packages out to the way far regions, the places that the, the bigger freight companies don't want to go. And one day, Glenn's dad is chilling with his friend Travis and his girlfriend when he gets a call to do a delivery out to Window Rock, which is out on the Navajo Reservation, about two hours from Farmington. And Travis says, hey, I got some family out there. I haven't seen them in forever. Why don't we go with you? Glenn was probably six or seven at the time, and it was summertime. So so his dad said, well, why don't we all just go? And Travis, you can go see your family for a while. We'll go check out Window Rock, which is this rock formation that's like a, a, a sheer cliff and it's got a hole in the middle so you can kind of see right through it. And so we'll check out the rock while you're visiting with your family and then we'll come back. Now, as it turns out, Glenn's dad, JJ, his truck is full of freight so they can't fit every, everybody into that truck. So they decide, well, well, let's just take two trucks. And if we're going to take two trucks, let's take walkie-talkies so we can talk to each other along the way. So off both trucks go to Window Rock. They get there. 
Travis peels off to go visit his family for a while. Glenn's dad makes his freight delivery, and then he and Glenn go check out Window Rock for a while. And when everybody's done, they get on the road to head back home. Now, Glenn says he was so young, most of the trip he doesn't even really remember. But this next part, he will never forget. So they're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. And one side of the road is sheer cliffs. And the other side is a huge field with a barbed wire fence separating the field from the highway. And it had just rained, so the roads were a little bit slick, and they're taking it kind of slow. So as they crest this hill, they look down at the bottom of the hill, and they see what looks to be a large dog sitting in the middle of the road. It's sitting back on its haunches, and it's looking at the cliffs. And Glenn's dad calls over the radio, Hey, Trav, you see that big-ass dog sitting in the road? And Travis yells back, that is not a dog. Hit it. Speed up and hit it. He sounds almost hysterical. He's just screaming, hit it. Speed up. Hit it. Hit that f***ing dog. Hit it. So his dad starts to speed up. And as they get closer, they can see it a little bit more clearly. And they can see that it's covered in this brown and gray matted fur that looks like it's crusted in blood. And it's still just sitting there looking at the cliff until the headlights hit it. When the headlights hit it, it turns its head and they can see it has a face. Now, Glenn says he doesn't know how else to describe it, except for kind of a mix between uh, a human face and a bear face. He said it's just undescribable and it's all twisted and distorted, almost like it's in pain. And as they continue to get closer to this thing, they realize that it is freaking huge. It's sitting down and its shoulder reaches about the top of the hood of the truck. So as the truck is continuing to barrel towards this thing, as it gets just inches from hitting it, this thing lets out a scream that sounded like somebody's lungs are filling with water. And it takes a leap backwards till it lands just on the highway side of the barbed wire fence. Then it takes one more backwards leap, clears the fence, and it is gone. And Travis comes back on the radio again and says, Holy shit, just keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go. We have to go faster. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. And he just kept repeating that over and over again. Faster. We have to go faster. So pretty soon, both trucks are speeding like crazy down the highway. And as they get to the outskirts of Gallup, they get pulled over. So both trucks pull over to the side of the road, which of course makes the officer, who happens to be a Navajo person himself, very nervous. So he gingerly steps up to Travis's truck and says, what are you guys doing? Why are you both pulling over together? And Travis says, we just saw a skinwalker and it's been following us. At which point, the officer stammers something about a verbal warning, jumps back into his cruiser, and takes off. And Travis and JJ and Glenn do the same. And they didn't see anything else that night, but Travis would not let Glenn and his dad go home without first giving them a Navajo totem to keep the evil spirits away. Joe says he was a kid when this happened. He and his uncle were out in the woods gathering and chopping some firewood for their grandmother. And it was starting to get late, so they finished up and they got in the truck to make their way back to Grandma's house. And they're on the dirt road. They're doing probably 30 miles an hour, give or take. When all of a sudden, Joe says he just felt like he was being watched. And he was just about to take a look out the passenger side window when his uncle says, Don't! Look at me! Just look at me. Don't look out the window. Just look at me. And Joe froze. He didn't know what was going on. His heart started to pound in his chest. And he says his heart damn near stopped when all of a sudden he could hear tapping on the passenger side window. So his uncle speeds up the truck to try to get out of there and starts praying in Navajo under his breath. And after a couple minutes, Joe thought maybe, maybe it was over until he felt the back bed of the truck dip like something heavy had just climbed in. And again, his uncle said, look at me. Don't look away. Just look at me. Keep looking at me. Don't look anywhere else. Look at me. And this time, Joe heard the tapping from the window 
behind him. And Joe said he he didn't know what was going on, but it was getting harder for him to breathe because he was starting to panic. And this went on for a couple more minutes like this when all of a sudden he felt the truck bed dip again. And his uncle looks around. (sighs) Everything was quiet. All they could hear was the truck and the road. And his uncle looked at him and said in Navajo, in the morning, we will have your father do a prayer so that evil will forget our faces. And Joe says he remembers just curling up into a ball on the seat of that truck and watching the clock minutes tick by and listening to his uncle sing a Navajo prayer under his breath until they got to grandma's house. So sometime later, Joe had a nightmare about that night. So he calls his uncle so they could talk about it for a little bit. And his uncle said, I never saw any faces, just eyes, like the brake lights you see on the road. But it was watching you. And when their conversation was over and they were about to hang up, Joe says he tried to joke with him about it and said, why didn't you just hit the brakes? And his uncle didn't laugh and just said, because it wasn't alone. It is the 4th of July weekend, and Brad and some of his friends want to actually do something besides sitting in front of their computers like they usually do. And there are five of them that weekend. Brad, JD, Elijah, Neil, and Neil's sister Katie. And Neil had the idea that they could all go to his and Katie's grandparents' house. They lived out on a farm, and they're in Texas, so... They had a lot of space. There's probably at least a half a mile to the nearest neighbor. So they could go out there and shoot off fireworks and have fun without getting into too much trouble. Now, the trip to their grandparents' house was about 40 miles. And unfortunately, all they had at their disposal was a little tiny two-door car. So it took a little while to get all five adults fit into that car. But they did it, and they were on their way. About halfway there, they stopped, everyone got out, they bought a bunch of fireworks, and then they all climbed back in for the rest of the ride to the farmhouse. And the drive was tolerable. They were kind of pretzeled in there, kind of funny, but Katie did a really good job in picking out some good music to make the time pass a little easier. When they got to the house, Neil had neglected to mention that his grandparents were actually out of town for the week which made the weekend in front of them even better. So they pull into the driveway and everybody piles out of the car, except Katie. Katie says, you know what, guys? We are going to need some drinks and some snacks. So I'm going to drive to Walmart. I'm going to pick up some supplies for us. I'll be back as soon as I can. But I'm taking the fireworks with me so you guys can't light them off while I'm gone. So she drives off and the rest of them are just standing there with no fireworks to light off. So they do the next best thing and go to the back of the house by the pool. Now, one thing about the property that kind of put Brad on edge was that it was right next to a forest. And Neil even went so far as to tell Brad that occasionally wolves would come out of the forest and they were kind of a hassle to deal with. So Brad gets all nervous, thinking he's got nothing to defend himself in case a wolf comes out of that forest and jumps over the fence. So Neil hands Brad his pocket knife and says, don't worry, should something go down, there's also a shotgun in the living room. And then he says, I'm going to go in the house and set up a game of risk that we can all play until Katie gets back. Katie's gone to Walmart. Walmart is a few miles down the road, so they know it's going to be a little bit before she gets back. So Neil goes back into the house and Elijah and Brad are just sitting there by the edge of the pool, regaling each other with tales of stupid stuff they did while they were in college. And while he and Elijah are chatting, Brad continues to stare at that forest line, worried about those wolves that Neil had just told him about when he thinks he sees something move. And he can't quite make out what it is. It's just starting to get dark out. And the porch light behind them made it kind of hard to see what is out there in the distance. But the way it moves makes his heart jump. And Elijah sees Brad's body stiffen as he kind of leans in to try to get a better look at what's out there. 
And Elijah says, what is it? And Brad says, it's a wolf in the tree line. And Elijah looks to where Brad is pointing and he calms down. And he says, dude, that's just Katie. She's just trying to scare us. And he starts yelling, Katie, Katie, man, you just scared the hell out of us. And Neil comes out of the house wondering what the hell Elijah's yelling about. And then he sees his sister standing in the field and he starts laughing when Elijah tells him how he had Brad sitting on the edge of his seat. And just then JD comes out of the house and Neil says, hey, why don't you go give Katie a hand, get the bags and get the fireworks out of the car and bring them in the house. And Katie, who's out in the field, starts to wave back. But the wave seems kind of out of place. It wasn't so much waving as it was a sudden jerk, like you're trying to pop your elbow back into place. And Elijah yells to Katie, hey, come on back. Hurry up. We want to start the party. But JD came back with a terrified look on his face. And he says, Katie's not back yet. I just called her. She's still on the road to Walmart. All the laughing stops. And Elijah's face fades as his arms fall into his lap with a thud. And they all look at that still jerking figure in the field. Then she screams. And the scream is so loud, it sounds like it's just a couple of feet in front of them. And they all get up, knocking over chairs, and scramble back into the house and slam the door behind them. And Neil shouts, lock the doors and somebody go grab the shotgun. So Brad's the closest one to it. So he runs and gets the shotgun while two others go and lock the two other outside doors. Brad grabs the gun, stuffs a couple of shells into his pocket, then runs back into the kitchen where everybody was huddled up and gives the gun to Neil. Neil takes the gun, grabs some more shells, puts them on the counter and loads one into the gun. JD's standing there covered in sweat, freaking out, saying, what the f*** was that? And Brad, who's just as scared as JD, asks, do you guys think maybe that's a skinwalker? Because between 4chan and creepypastas, he had read all about these things. And JD says, it can't be. It's just Katie. She's just trying to scare us. And Neil barks out, cut the bullshit, JD. That scream was not human. And you already called her. We know she's not here. And he turns around and goes back toward the patio door and pushes the blinds aside just a little bit, enough to see that the Katie thing was even closer to them. Now she's by the gates of the pool and being illuminated by the porch light, where they can see that what is standing there really doesn't look much like Katie at all. Her hair is a mess. Her clothes are all ripped and in tatters and she's bruised all over. And the one thing that caught Neil's eye the most was her face. Her head was tilted like whatever it is was was struggling to support the weight. And her eyes were devoid of all emotion and her jaw was just hanging open. And she raises her arm and starts to wave again in that same jerking wave. But the jerking starts getting more violent. And her entire body starts to shake. And Neil quickly backs up, closes the curtains. Everybody behind the counter. As he sets himself in the gap leading to the kitchen with the gun aimed at the door. And it was silent for what felt like an hour. The three other guys stood not moving a muscle, just staring at Neil, who was completely focused on that door. When a massive, grotesque smell entered their noses, the horrid stench was like if you took groceries and let them ferment in a box for a few days in the summer heat and then added a couple of carcasses for garnish. It was definitely hard to breathe. And if you plugged your nose, you just got the smell stuck to the back of your throat instead. It was so bad, JD actually ended up throwing up. 
then the smell was gone. The hot, thick air that carried that smell just vanished. And Brad was afraid to let go of his nose, but was rewarded with nice, fresh air when he finally did. And they all took a number of deep breaths to rid their lungs of that horrible smell. And Neil asks, is everyone okay? And everyone was, except JD, whose stomach was still hurting from puking. Then they hear what sounds like a whine, like a mixture between a dog whine and a child just starting to cry. But it wasn't coming from the patio door. It was coming from the front of the house where they had come in. And they all stood up and started moving that direction with Neil taking the front. And Elijah, JD, and Brad all huddle on the stairway, still hearing this thing whining. And then it hit Brad that it wasn't really so much whining as it sounded more like something trying to talk for the first time, like an animal. He could actually kind of make out a little bit of what this high-pitched, raspy voice was trying to say. And it kept repeating this until it started to sound more enunciated, more human. It sounded like JD. Same accent, same speech pattern, same voice. And JD started to shiver and his breath started getting really shallow. And he shouted back in a voice that no one had heard come from JD before. Get out! Leave us alone! Just get the fuck out! Leave us alone! Get out! But these last words were said with the same scream that they heard come from it when they'd first seen it. And it starts to pound on the door. Not like it's trying to break the door down, but more like it's just knocking impatiently, waiting for somebody to answer. And it starts to scream again in that first scream that they heard when they encountered it initially. Get out! Get out! They were all terrified. The inhuman screams, the pounding on the door. Brad started crying. He thought for sure this is it for all of them, that none of them are getting out of this house. Neil's not scared. He's pissed. He stands up, starts walking to the door, screaming, yanks the door open and points his gun at whatever it is that's on the other side, pulls the trigger, leaving all of their ears full of the sound of a shotgun blast. And Neil is still standing at the door, huffing, just wanting to rip this thing apart. And Brad slowly stands up to see past Neil's arm and sees nothing but a shell on the ground as Neil reloads the gun. And Brad keeps looking, but all he can see past Neil's shoulders is the driveway and the road that they came in on. There's nothing there, dead or otherwise. And Neil turns back around and his adrenaline is starting to fade a little bit. So he's getting a little shaky. He says, we are not staying here. JD, call Katie. Let her know that as soon as she gets back, we are getting the fuck out of here. So as JD calls Katie, they all gather back into the kitchen. And the shotgun is laying on the counter with several more shells by the butt, just in case. And the minutes felt like Hours. Nobody wants to say anything. Nobody even wants to look at each other. They are all just counting the seconds until Katie gets there. And when she calls and says, Hey, I'm in the driveway. What the hell is going on? 
going on. They all start gathering up their stuff and heading for the front door. Neil quickly writes a note to his grandparents and leaves it on the gun so his grandparents will know what happened. And they all, as a group, head out the door and run for the car. And as they pile in and tell Katie, go, 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 Katie's like, somebody tell me what happened. But nobody wants to talk. So Katie just turns her music back on, hoping that maybe it might make them feel a little bit better. But all Brad can hear is that blood curdling scream telling them to get out. The original poster of this story goes by CLT14. We're just going to call her Claire. Claire lives on the Navajo Reservation, not far from Chinle, Arizona, and is always hearing creepy stories from friends and relatives. And growing up, even had a few scary experiences of her own. But on April 10th, 2010, she had the scariest experience of them all. That morning, Claire's mom was worried about Claire's grandma being alone in her house. So dad goes and picks up grandma at her house and brings her back to Claire's house. And later that day, her parents want to take grandma out to go have some fun. But Claire really doesn't want to go with them. They're heading out for a night at the casino. So Claire says, mm, no thanks. And after they leave, she enjoys an awesome afternoon and evening all to herself. As evening turns to night, she makes sure that both of her parents' cars are locked, that the front and back doors to the house are locked, and that the windows to the house are shut and locked. And as it's creeping closer to midnight, she decides to watch a little TV. And she remembers falling asleep on the couch with the TV still on. At 2.50 a.m., she wakes up, turns off the TV, goes to her bedroom to get her pajamas on, and goes to the bathroom and brushes her teeth. And when she's finished, she walks to the kitchen to turn out the light. Just when she's ready to flip that switch, the clock starts to chime, signaling 3 a.m. And before it can even finish its 3 a.m. proclamation, Claire hears a knock at the front door. Confused, she thinks to herself, who in the hell would be at my house at 3 a.m.? And she hears another knock. And then another. And she thinks, do I open it? And she starts walking toward the door. And she starts leaning in to get a look through the peephole when the knocking gets louder. Now their front door has this little entrance space. So it's like this little room that you have to walk through to either walk in or walk out of the house. And there's a security light in there that always turns on when someone steps into that room. And Claire backs away from the door and thinks, why didn't that security light turn on? And she gets scared and she starts backing away from the door when the knocking turns into banging. And after about two minutes of constant banging, she can't take it anymore, and she starts moving toward the door. She unlocks the top lock on the door, and the banging gets even louder. It seems like whatever it is, is gonna break down the door. So as she's standing still by the door, fear trying to get the best of her, she turns on the outside light, hoping to scare whatever or whoever it is away, but it doesn't work. The banging gets louder and she is ready to bolt and go call for help, but she decides she needs to see what is on the other side of that peephole. And Claire takes a deep breath, leans in closer to the door and gets her eye up to that tiny opening and the noises disappear and there's no one on the other side. This story is from Kibbles13. She didn't give her name, so I'm going to call her Sienna. And Sienna's story takes place in October of 2011. At the time, she and her family were living on the reservation in the middle of nowhere, Arizona. And she says a lot of crazy skinwalker stuff happened out there. But this night sticks out as being the scariest one ever. 
Sienna's parents were out playing bingo with her grandmother, and she was home alone with her little brother Hayden and her other brother Wyatt, who is the same age as she is. And Sienna and Wyatt want to pull an all-nighter, as teens left to their own devices will do. And they each chug a couple of monster drinks throughout the course of the evening. The three of them are just hanging out and watching The Lion King until they stop around 2.30 to get Hayden to bed. And after changing into his PJs and brushing his teeth, Hayden crawls into bed and Sierra tucks him in. And she remembers the clock in Hayden's room says 2.53 a.m. when she left to go join Wyatt in the living room to finish watching the last couple of minutes of the movie. And despite their energy drink infusion, once the movie is over, they are so tired, they decide to just camp out on the living room floor. So Wyatt turns off the TV, Sierra turns off the lamp, the clock strikes 3 a.m. And Sierra yells, Ah, we made it to 3 a.m., but dang, we are not going to make an all-nighter. And the kids lay down on the floor, and Sierra's eyelids slam shut, but spring right back open again when someone starts knocking at the door. A few minutes later, another knock, but at the window. And Sierra thinks to herself, oh my God, that energy drink is really doing a number on me. A few seconds later... Someone whistles, and she pokes Wyatt and says, Stop it! You're scaring me! And Wyatt groggily lifts his head and says, What? Not doing anything. And then another, louder bang on the door. It sounds like someone or something really wants to get in. And they have two blue healers who bark at just about anything, who've been quiet all night. But after they hear that last loud bang, they start going nuts. Wyatt goes to the door and is about one step away from opening it when Sierra grabs the back of his shirt and says, are you insane? We can't open that door. So instead, Wyatt creeps to the window and looks out. And the house has a security light by the door, but it hasn't gone on. So it's completely dark outside. I don't see anybody, he says. Sierra and her brother are now officially freaked. The visitor, or whatever it is, keeps whistling, while another one keeps banging on the door. And while all this is happening, Wyatt grabs Sierra's iPod and starts recording all of these noises that they're hearing. And while those two are busy in the living room, Hayden wakes up in his room, scared. And he goes to the window, looks out, and sees this big black shadow that's tall and skinny and it stares at him through the window for a good minute or two then it just runs away and Hayden freaks out closes the curtains and runs to go get Sierra all three of them are now huddled up in the living room freaked out and totally scared until the clock strikes 4 a.m. all the whistling all the banging all the noise stops the kids breathe a collective sigh of relief and start running around the house, turning on all of the lights, including the bathroom lights. And half an hour later, their parents come home and say, oh, you guys are still up? And Sierra, Wyatt, and Hayden all look at each other and say, we're not going to sleep. Mom and dad ask, why? So the kids told them their story of everything that had happened that night and even played the recording of all of the noises for them. Dad says, skinwalkers. Those are definitely skinwalkers. They use animal bones to make those loud whistles. And in the morning, the kids show their parents and the medicine man where the skinwalkers were doing whatever it was that they were doing. And around the window and the door, they see footprints and pick up some bones. The medicine man tells Hayden that he's very lucky that he didn't get cursed by that skinwalker that was outside his window, and that it's a really good thing that Wyatt didn't open that door. Now, as some of you might already know, Many Navajo people are reluctant to talk about skinwalkers. They believe if you talk about them, you will draw their attention. Well, Rick 
however, did not grow up on the Navajo reservation. He grew up away from it and so was very naive on the subject. And when it came to skinwalkers, he was a skeptic. His mom used to tell a story of how back in the 80s, when she lived with her siblings and his grandparents, how she and her sister saw one on the driveway under a streetlight. And she describes it as a big black dog with dirty fur and a twisted noodle-like front leg and these unnatural eyes with a soft burnt orange glow. And Rick, being his close-minded self, doubted every word, although he never told his mother that. But those doubts changed last year when he went to visit his grandparents in October. He and his family had just finished scourging the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair and were calling it a night. Now their house was close enough that they could walk home in like 10 minutes. So they did. And it was probably about nine o'clock when they got home and they all stayed up until like 2 a.m. just catching up on family matters and local news. And it was during that time that Rick decided to open his mouth and blurt out the question, hey, are skinwalkers real? Guys, you shouldn't be asking about that, his grandmother said with a scold in her voice. And at that point, both she and his grandfather decided it was time for bed. And after being quietly scolded by his mom, one of his aunts chimes in with a very cautious tone and says, yes, they are real, all right. We had a few screaming outside of our trailer a few nights ago. Your cousin had nightmares all night and woke up crying in the morning. Not wanting to push the point any further, they all decided to just go to bed. Now, the trailer that was their home was pretty old, didn't have air conditioning, so they were all sleeping with the windows open and just with the screens so the breeze could come through. And everyone had drifted off to sleep except Rick. His mind was going a million miles a minute thinking about skinwalkers. And he started to wonder, I wonder now that I'm on the reservation, if maybe I might see one. And that is when the shit hit the fan. Just as Rick was settling down, relaxing and almost ready to fall asleep, he started to hear something moving outside. So he got up off the couch and wandered over to the kitchen window. And all the lights were off inside the trailer. The only light around was from the porch light out in front. And Rick was actually thinking he was kind of glad that that was the case because if there was a skinwalker out there, maybe it wouldn't notice him looking at it. So he finally musters up the courage to take a look out the window. And all he sees are the cars in the driveway and the trash cans on the side of the road. And after about a good five seconds of scanning the area, he doesn't see anything. He turns around and he starts going back to bed thinking it was probably just a stray cat or something. And he only gets about two steps when he hears this distorted screaming from outside coming from someplace definitely close. And Rick pushes past the fear that's rising in his stomach and looks out the window again, and he sees it. A coyote-like figure is staring in his direction from behind the cars, just out of reach of the porch light. Only it looked really wrong and gave off a really evil vibe just looking at it. It was gray with very disheveled hair and an evil dark orange glow coming from its eyes. So Rick says, I don't think so, and runs back to the bedroom. And at this point, he notices an awful stench of rotting meat filling the trailer. So Rick starts trying to wake up his mom. And his mom's like, ugh, it is 3 a.m. What do you want? And Rick tells her in a shaky voice, um, there's, there's something scary outside. And his mom says, still trying to go back to sleep, ugh. It's the res. There are animals wandering all the time. It's just a stray cat or something. And Rick is thinking, she is obviously not getting the drift of what it is I am trying to say. So he screams, there is some Blair Witch Project shit going on outside, Ma. That got her attention. And his mom says, what? What the hell are you talking about? And just then, 
They both heard it. The unnatural screaming coming from outside, as well as what sounded like something thrashing around on the ground. Rick says, hear that? That's what I'm talking about. So both Rick and his mom got up and made their way back to that kitchen window. And they looked outside, and sure enough, that coyote thing was making its way toward the front door. And it walked with an odd limp, and it dragged one of its back legs like it was handicapped. They could hear it start to scratch on the front door as it's making this odd, muffled moaning sound. So Rick's mom went and got Rick's dad, and they both start yelling at this thing in Navajo, telling it to go away, that it's not welcome here. Well, all this commotion is enough to wake up everyone, and they all start coming out into the hallway. And his mom looks at everyone and says, Skinwalker, as she's pointing to the window. But apparently, they already knew what to do. As his grandfather comes out, grabs his handgun, gets a bag of ashes out of the kitchen drawer, coats the bullets in ashes, and loads them back into the gun. Then he marches straight to the front door, whips it open, yelling something in Navajo so fast that Rick couldn't quite understand, and fires two shots into the dark. But nothing. The thing managed to escape before Rick's grandpa could shoot it. And the only thing his grandpa said was, that's the fastest one I've ever seen. And the next thing you know, Rick's aunts and his parents are all freaking out and saying things like, what if it comes back tomorrow? And it saw us. Does that mean that we're all targets now? But his grandparents calmed everybody down and got everybody back to bed. The next morning, Rick's grandparents called one of the neighbors and explained to them everything that had happened. Apparently, one of their neighbors was a medicine man who used to partake in ceremonies of healing and curing sickness. And he came over and gave each member of the family a blessing and blessed the grounds outside the house. And Rick is no longer a skeptic. Jenny and her family live in a small rural community on the Navajo Reservation. And one night, her aunt and her two uncles were home alone while her grandparents were away at a meeting. And like many houses on the reservation at that time, they didn't have electricity. And it had already gotten dark outside, so her aunt and two uncles were starting to get ready for bed. All of a the sudden, they start hearing sounds outside of the house, like somebody was moving things around outside. And so her oldest uncle went and took a look out the window and saw a figure out by their truck, which is weird because they were miles away from the nearest neighbor. But whatever it was, opened the door to the truck and started rifling through all of the personal possessions they had in the truck. Now, the three kids were scared, but they knew that they had to do something. So the oldest uncle goes to the closet and gets the rifle. And he's so young, it takes him a little bit to get himself steady. But he steadies himself as the other uncle flew open the door and he takes aim at the figure. And now the figure sees them standing there with the gun and turns and starts walking toward them, totally unfazed by the fact that they had a weapon. So the uncle pulls the trigger, but nothing happens. And as the figure grows closer and closer, the stench hits her aunt so bad, the stench of like rotting corpse hits her so hard, she almost throws up. And her uncle is still there pulling the trigger, but nothing is happening. And the figure just keeps getting closer and closer and closer until just then, off in the distance, some headlights start coming down the highway. Jenny's grandparents are coming home. Now the figure sees the lights coming down the road. So it kind of moves off and tucks itself behind a tree that's, that's near the house. And as grandma and grandpa are getting out of the truck, the uncle with the gun runs out to tell his father what's going on and points to the figure behind a tree, which is poking its head out to look and see what's going on. So the grandfather grabs the gun, goes into the house, grabs some ashes, rubs the ashes over the gun, rubs the ashes over a bullet, and chambers the bullet in the rifle. He then walks out onto the porch and takes a shot at the thing behind the tree. And as the gunshot echoes, the thing starts running. And at that point, Grandma takes Jenny's aunt and gets her into the house 
while the grandfather takes his two boys and they take off after it. Now, they're in their pickup truck trying to chase this thing, and there aren't a whole lot of roads and paths, so they're kind of going off-road with the pickup truck, and so the headlights are kind of bouncing all over and not fixed on any one spot. But Jenny's uncle swears that any time the headlights actually hit the figure, what he saw was a woman, and she was running on all fours. Now, eventually, Grandpa had to stop the truck because they were coming up on this ravine that was like a 20-foot drop. So they had run out of room. They had to stop the truck. So Grandpa gets out of the truck and starts yelling in Navajo at the thing. But he's yelling at the thing like he knows who it is. He yells, I am not scared. I know it's you, and you'd better leave my family alone. A few days passed, and the family got news that the woman that Jenny's grandfather was yelling about had passed away. Jenny says she's always been told that if you know who the skinwalker is, say their name and it will kill them. Marie writes in, she and some co-workers had a bonfire out in the woods. And it wasn't huge. There was only seven or eight people there and she knew most of them. And so for the first hour, it was super fun. They were about a mile away from civilization. And it was in rural Utah, so there are not many cars going around. There's not much traffic if you did need help. And out of the whole group, there really was only one person that she didn't know. But she didn't think anything of it. She just thought that they were a friend of one of her co-workers. He was a tall, skinny, white dude with black hair and blue eyes. And she noticed that he was kind of distant. He didn't talk a whole lot to too many people. He was very reserved. But she didn't think too much of that because she figured if she's a friend of a co-worker, that that kind of behavior would be expected. But as time went on, she noticed that he would kind of randomly stare at people. And that's when he kind of started to feel a little off to her. But before she started asking anybody who he was, she started to just watch him a little closer. The way that he moved was really strange. The way that he walked was kind of strange. The way that he moved his body and his head was kind of weird. And this kind of made her paranoid. So she started asking her co-workers if they knew this guy. And one by one, she would ask them and they would say, no, I thought he was with somebody else. And once she figured out that none of her co-workers were with this guy, she figures that is enough. She went around to each co-worker then told them what was happening, said, this guy's not with anybody. We need to get out of here. And all of her co-workers agreed. So they all agreed to pack up and go back to Marie's house instead. So they all packed up their stuff, pretending that they were calling it quits for the night, saying goodbye to each other, and packed everything up in the cars. And this guy didn't get into any car. He just stood near the woods and waved goodbye. And as she drove off, she's in the car with a colleague of hers who's also her friend. And they look back and the guy had disappeared, like in an instant. And if that wasn't creepy enough, Marie had just had one of the windows in her car broken out. So she could hear everything going on around her. And on their way out of the woods, every now and then, she could swear she heard screaming or somebody calling her name. And that just made her and her friend terrified. They just kept hearing these noises like a horse name or a dog whining or somebody calling their name or screaming or wolves howling. And something just told Marie that, that whatever it is was making these noises to lure her into the woods. But luckily, nobody in her party of co-workers took the bait. As they're leaving the gravel road, getting ready to turn onto the main road, Marie's car is last. So she's got a really good view of everything happening behind her. And from her rear view mirror, she sees someone run across the road way faster than any human being should be able to run. And it was tall, skinny, and super pale. And it freaked her out so bad at that point that she just gunned it on the road and passed all of her co-workers and her friend in the passenger seat asked her what was wrong but she was just so terrified she couldn't speak she just 
all she could do was pay attention to the road and drive. And at one point, she almost drove off the road into the woods. And she finally snapped out of it when another co-worker called her and asked her what was going on. So she, of course, lied and said everything was fine. And he, of course, didn't believe her and kept goading her to tell him what was wrong. But she just kept saying, nope. Everything is fine until he gave up and finally said, fine, we'll meet you back at your house. And now Marie says she is terrified to go near any woods or sometimes even just to leave her house. And she thinks that if her instincts had not kicked in and told her to leave and get everyone else out of there, someone at that bonfire would never have been heard from again. The writer of this story goes by the initials DN. So we are going to call her Dina. And one Friday night, Dina, her older brother, and her older sister are all driving home for the weekend. And they need to drive from Phoenix to Low Mountain, which is near Pinion, Arizona. And it's about a five hour drive. And unfortunately, they got a late start. So they are going to be driving well into the night. And they're taking their usual route and they're going down Keems Canyon Highway to a dirt road that will take them right to Low Mountain. And the reservation is really dark at night and there's almost no one driving on the roads. And so they're on the highway right before they reach that dirt road and they see an old woman walking on the side of the road with a cane at 2 a.m. She has a scarf around her head, a long black jacket, And is wearing a green dress. And they didn't think too much about it. But they did think it was kind of weird that she was walking on the side of the highway that late. But they keep driving and eventually get to their dirt road turnoff. And about a mile from the highway, they see that same old woman walking with a cane on the side of the dirt road. And Dina, she just freaks out. She knows that is the same woman that they just saw 15 miles back and her brother just steps on the gas and starts driving faster and they eventually get to a highway that takes them either to Chinle, Low Mountain or Pinion. They pass the first bridge and they realize the old woman is again in front of them sitting on the highway with her head down waving her cane in the air before they can pass her the car just shuts down and Dina's brother keeps trying to get it started, trying to get it started, but it will not start. And the old lady stands up facing away from them so they can't see her face and walks to the opposite side of the road. And she turns to face them and they can see that her face is painted all black. And she turns around and keeps walking and disappears into the darkness. And Dina's brother turns the ignition one more time, and the car starts. When they finally do get home, they tell their parents about what happened. And Dina's dad said that he knew of an old couple that lived between the highways that did bad medicine on people. And he also said that her husband passed away not long ago, and she sometimes walks that road. And when the kids did leave to go back, they ended up taking the long way. And Dina said it was very real and very scary. And she never wants to drive down that road again. This story comes from Curiosity 13. We'll call her Corey. One summer Saturday in 1988, Corey, her boyfriend Andy, his cousin Mark, and Mark's girlfriend, Tracy, were doing their usual quad riding in the mountains behind Andy's house. And just for a little background, Andy's family owned hundreds of acres, and that land had been in his family back to the early 1900s. All the parents are back at the main house, hanging out and playing cards. And this was pretty much business as usual for them back then. Now, on this particular weekend, Corey's quad isn't really running so hot. And since they don't really want to worry about having a quad break down on the trail, Corey just jumps on the back of Andy's quad. And about an hour or so into their ride, they decide to take a break at this spot a little bit off the trail that they'd already set up with some logs and stuff so they could just sit there and hang out for a while. And there's an open, clear sky with a nice 
bright full moon that night. So they don't even need to bring any lights. And their eyes adjust to the dark pretty quickly. And the four kids are just sitting around having so much fun, just chatting and laughing and looking at the beautiful sky. When Tracy's face turns to a mask of fright and shock, she's looking straight behind Corey and she starts to shake and the tears well up in her eyes and stream down her face fast and furious. And Corey stands up and walks over to her and asks, what's wrong? But Tracy is totally frozen in fear. Corey then turns around to look in the direction that Tracy is looking. And that's when she sees it. And she stands straight up and moves a little bit in front of Tracy and grabs Andy and points to the tree line. Andy's eyes follow where Corey is pointing and Andy's eyes grow huge as he spots it. So then he grabs Mark and points to the tree line so Mark can see it. They all see what Tracy sees. It has a big husky body, kind of like a bear, but not a bear. Its head looks like something you would expect to see on a caveman, but it's on all fours and has legs like a horse. It's super weird. It's like nothing on this thing belongs with the rest of it. Like it morphed into all these things in a confused sort of way. And the eyes, the eyes seem like they're glowing blue, like a blue flame. Needless to say, they are all terrified. This thing starts to growl at them and slowly starts stepping forward. So all the kids start backing up and Corey motions to Tracy not to run. As calmly and as quietly as she can, Corey tells Tracy, get back on your quad, put it in neutral, and start backing it up. Tracy gets going and starts making her way back down to a spot in the trail where she can just coast her way down. Meanwhile, the beast lunges at the other three kids and kind of starts walking toward them in almost like a territorial bluff kind of way. And Corey and Mark get on the two remaining quads. Andy grabs the rifle that he always keeps with him and fires a shot, both to try to scare the beast away and as a distress call. This is pre-cell phone days. So this was their way of letting their parents know we have a problem. So as Corey and Mark are slowly making their way back down the hill on the quads, Andy is walking backwards, never taking his eye off of this creature that is still moving and stalking in their direction. Luckily, this thing's glowing blue eyes made it really easy for Andy to keep a bead on it. And as they make it about halfway down the trail, they meet up with Andy's dad and his uncle who'd been coming up the trail. And Tracy runs to them and basically just collapses at their feet. And they start trying to help Tracy, thinking she's got some kind of a medical issue. When Mark calls out to them, points up the trail and tells him to look for the flaming blue eyes. Andy's uncle sees it first and trains his spotlight on the creature. And now they can see it clearly for the first time. And they are horrified at what they see. This creature now has no hair at all. And it looks like it's inside out. This is the nastiest thing that any of them has ever seen. They start shooting at it and it bolts away fast. And they think they got it with at least one shot, but they all head back to the house for the night because it's too dark and too dangerous to go looking for it now. The next morning, they all, except Tracy, gather together and head back out onto the trail to go back to the spot where they shot at the thing the night before. And they look around for tracks or blood or anything that will give them a clue as to either what this thing was or where it came from. Strangely, they found nothing. No tracks, no blood. It was as if the creature were never there, even though they all saw it with their own eyes. And according to Corey, Tracy was way too terrified to ever go back out on those trails again. But Corey, well, she's 
always been fascinated with things of the strange, dark, and mysterious variety. She says she was mesmerized the whole time she was looking at that thing. And she truly believes it was some kind of demon or goblin or whatever word you want to give it. Corey, Annie, and Mark still go out on those trails regularly, just a little bit more mindful of their surroundings. But they never did see it again. (laughs) 